Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Becky and I'm Enterprise Manager here at UEL. Hi, my name is Kaziza, I'm Enterprise Advisor here at UEL. So before we start, um, I just want to test whether you can all hear us. Um, if you can hear us, can you type yes in the chat function? So Cadiz is just typing in the chat function. So if you could just all confirm whether you can hear us, if you can type yes in the chat function. Great. Yes, June said yes. Perfect. So we know somebody can hear us. Okay. So we've got a yes from a couple of people, but just waiting. That's fine. I right, say so you can just continue. Okay. Looks like we've got a positive response. So we are going to make a start. Um, so yeah, as I said, welcome. This is one of two webinars that we're doing on business and entrepreneurship. Um, and just to give you a little bit of context, Enterprise at UEL are a service. We're completely free for students and alumni. Um, and we support you to develop entrepreneurial ideas um, and start up your business. And we support businesses up to 12 to 18 months in their journey and lifespan. So just to give you some examples, uh, we've born many businesses out of the service here at UEL. Some people start businesses related to their studies. Some people do something completely different. Um, so we've got MSc students starting sustainability businesses. We've got a mechanical engineering student that started a really thriving food company. Um, so we have a huge diversity of businesses that have been born out of UEL. And that's all been through um, the support and development and funding from the institution. So what we're going to cover today, um, we are going to look at the three lenses of designing your business and the first steps that you can take when you're exploring your business. So we're going to go through four key actions that you can go away with to really test whether or not your business um, and you can move forward with that. So um, the three lenses of human centered design is where we start in the entrepreneurship conversation. So this was developed by an innovation company called IDEO. Um, and really it's designed on the fact that innovation and entrepreneurship lies within people's needs. And it's a creative approach to developing and launching a business. So throughout the rest of the session, we're going to go through each one of these in more detail so you can apply that to your idea. We've added one more element to that. So the four functions or the fundamentals of this approach are your entrepreneurial IQ. So assessing your own skills for entrepreneurship, where your strengths are and where you maybe need to develop. They're looking at the feasibility of the idea. So what is the plan and how can you take that forward? 
they're looking at the viability of the idea so the numbers like does this work does it cost you less or more than what you're going to make and then finally the desirability so is there a customer is there an audience for that business and these are the four key steps that you need to take before embarking um, on an entrepreneurial journey Hi everyone, so as I mentioned, my name is Kisa. If you missed the beginning, um, I'm Enterprise Advisor here. So we're gonna look more about entrepreneurial IQ. Are you the right person to start this business? And the first thing I would say is first look at yourself, your own strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So this is what's called a SWOT analysis. You may have done this before, usually on a product or service um, or a policy, maybe at university, but what we're going to do is do this for you. So this is a point of homework and we're gonna give you lots of homework throughout the, throughout the session. Um, so you can continue to work on this after we finish, but really look down at what skills do you have? What skills gaps do you have? What would you like to learn? Um, what are you excelling in? And how can you turn that into value to start that business as well? And any threats, so maybe you like to procrastinate or you're time poor, wherever that may be, and just get a good grasp of what you can offer and also who else can you bring on to help you start that business. So we've got this thing called the Entrecomp framework, which basically is the entrepreneurial competencies. So this is a variety of competencies that have been developed to help you understand where you excel in terms of as an entrepreneur. So this is a little sheet that we will drop in at the end, so you can do this in your own time, looking at different um, qualities of entrepreneurs. So everything from being self-confident to being motivated, resourceful, creative, um, able to manage risk, etc. So I've done one just so you can have a look as well. Um, and I've also highlighted which points that I can kind of continue to develop. So this is something we'll let you go through in your own time but it just gives you a quick snapshot of your skill sets as well and how entrepreneurial you would be considered using the Entrecom framework. Um, another thing to look at is the growth mindset and the fixed mindset so people consider entrepreneurs to be more growth mindset orientated so if you kind of hear yourself saying things like failure is an opportunity to grow, challenges help me grow, I like to try new things as opposed to uh, failure is the limit of my abilities, I'm either good at it or I'm not, those are the kind of things that you might be saying or thinking, um, it tells you which kind of pool you sit in. So being growth mindset based is considered more entrepreneurial in the field, but we'll see a mixture of the two. So the most important thing to take away from that entrepreneurial IQ is that the difference between starting your own business and being self-employed and being employed is that when you're employed, people send you on training courses, um, you have a manager who supports you with your self-development. But when you are self-employed, you have to take responsibility and accountability for that. So when you start your entrepreneurial journey, it's really good, important to take stock of exactly where you are, what skills you have. So you've got a really strong skill set in your product area, but perhaps you're not as strong on the finances, the tax, all of those um, kind of logistical elements of running the business. So then it's setting yourself goals and a plan um, to help you upskill and develop in those areas or find team members and people that can support you. So that's the first step is really looking at yourself and what skills you have. The second element um, is, is your idea. So being able to really articulate what your idea is. Um, one of the, the things we hear thousands of ideas and people really struggle to talk about their idea in a really succinct way and really define what it is. So this model here is really useful. This is the features and benefits model. Um, so to give you an example here, this is an iPhone. Um, and normally when we do this workshop in-house, we get people to work on what they think the features and benefits of an iPhone are. Um, but I'm gonna give you the answers um, and reflect on these. So the features of an idea, a product or a service, 
are the kind of fundamentals of that. So the features of an iPhone are that, you know, it's got a 12 megapixel camera, um, it's got different storage options, it's available in different colors, um, it's got the battery life for 14 hours. So for you, what are the features of your idea? Um, if it's a service, do you offer an hour workshop? Do you offer a, a program? Do you offer a package? Um, and if it is one of those, what are all the different elements of that package? So what do people actually get for their money? And similarly with a product, if you're launching a t-shirt company, um, are they, do they come in small, medium and large? What colours do they come in? What are they made out of? Um, so the, the kind of one side of it is the real features. So what are the kind of frameworks of your product or service? And then the second element is obviously the benefit, all the things that make it better than its competitors that are your selling points and that make it really strong. So iPhones fit in your pocket, they store thousands of songs, they connect you with you know, an international audience. So it's really important to know both the features and the benefits of your product or your service. And it's really important at the beginning to really list those because you're going to need the benefits to sell them and you're going to need the features to kind of really plan out um, the next steps with your idea. And this is a step that people often miss and don't take um, and it's the real detail that you need. So really recommend doing a features and benefits table for your own business to really flesh that idea out. Um, the next one is that the old age unique selling point. So you might have a number of benefits to your business, but what's the one thing that's going to take um, advantage? What's the one thing that's going to make your idea really stand out? Um, so at the beginning, it's really important to think about what is unique about you. Um, it doesn't have to be that this idea has never existed before at all. Um, I come from Essex, where there are probably 20 tanning salons in my high street, but they're all known for different things. One's cheaper, um, one is really premium, one gives you a better tan than the other, one lets in people that are underage. They're all known for different things. So what is the thing that if you're a fashion brand, what are you going to be known for? If you're a food product, if you're an educational service, what is going to be really different about you? And then finally, in articulating your idea, it's the elevator pitch. And this is a model that you can use to start to form your elevator pitch and start to form how you talk about your business. Um, so I'm going to give you an example of this for UEL Enterprise. So um, UEL Enterprise is for students and alumni who are looking to start a business. We are a lead in the industry because unlike our competition, all our staff have started their own business. So I've used that framework in front of you to develop a short, very succinct um, pitch for my service. Um, and it's a it's something that you can use. So um, KFC is for young people who love to eat chicken. Um, it's a lead takeaway organization because it's got a secret recipe. And unlike all their competition, they keep their secret rep recipe a secret and no one else can make chicken like them. Um, that's completely made up on the cuff. Um, so if you spend a little bit more time developing that, that can become your really key pitch. Um, and as an entrepreneur, be ready to start pitching your business left, right and centre. You will be asked what you do every single day. So this needs to be on the tip of your tongue um, and you need to have a really strong pitch um, at those early stages. OK, so the second element so we've done entrepreneurial IQ and kind of articulating the idea. And then the second element of the um, IDEO framework is viability. So viability um, is essentially your numbers. 
you know, ultimately, is this business going to bring in more money than you're going to spend? Is this going to be income generating? Is this viable for you to move forward with? And in order to assess the viability at these really early stages, you look at two things. So one element is you need to look at the market that you're entering. And the second element is you need to look at the numbers and do some early analysis of the numbers. So what I mean by looking at the market is doing a bit of a kind of competitor analysis of your market. So the example in front of you here is for um, car brands. Um, and again, if you were here in the room with us, we'd be engaging with you and getting you to plot these because um, everyone has really different opinions about this exercise. Um, but on the left hand axis, you've obviously got high price, low price. And then on the bottom, you've got low quality, high quality. So right at the top there, you've got um, Ferrari, the highest priced car um, manufacturer in this example. And we've got it really high on the axis of quality. Um, and then in the middle there, you've got BMW because it does, you know, it has some high end offerings. It has some lower end offerings. Um, the quality is fairly mid market in terms of people's opinion. Um, this exercise obviously is very different. So what we encourage you to do is plot your own market. So look at who are the key players in the industry that you're entering? Where do they price themselves? Where are they in terms of quality? Um, and you should really have quite a robust understanding of the market that you're entering. Um, sometimes people struggle with this exercise particularly if you're doing something entirely new, you know, if you're looking to launch a technology business that has never existed in the market, you know, if you have got the next Facebook out there, um, A, we want to hear from you, but B, um, how do you start to plot that market? And I'm just preempting questions here, really. Um, ultimately, what you need to do is think about if someone wasn't using my service or product, so if they wasn't weren't using Facebook, what else would they be accessing? What else would they be doing? So what is the type of market that you're entering? But if anyone is struggling with this, at the end, we're going to give you contact details. Um, and please get in touch with us. And we're really ha happy to talk this exercise through with you, as we are with any of the exercises um, that you see today. So the first element of viability is looking at what's the market that you're entering, what are they charging, and what is the quality. And then obviously, finally, you've got to plot yourself in there. Where do you sit? Are you going to be more expensive than Ferrari, or are you going to be cheaper, or what does that look like? So that's the market element of looking at your viability. You then have the financial element of your viability. So in order to assess the financial element here, um, you need to have an understanding of your direct and your indirect costs. So a direct cost is a cost that you can directly attribute back to the production or the development of your product or service. So if you are um, making t-shirts, a direct cost is uh, the fabric, the labels, the stitching, um, maybe you've paid someone to make that for you, so the manufacturing. So directly, I can link all of the costs of those items back to the product or service. Similarly, if you're delivering a workshop, you know, the pens, the paper, the resources that you use for that delivery, you can directly link those two together. Um, an indirect cost is a cost is the running cost of the business so um, it's your marketing your rent your insurance it's all of the costs the ongoing running costs that you pay every month and they support the running of the business but you can't directly link that back to your product or your service so when you're starting out, it's really hard to know what these costs are going to be because they change and the business evolves and develops. Um, 
but you can start making lists and you can start doing kind of Google searches. So if you absolutely know I'm going to need to rent, you know, a little office, you can start getting roundabout costs for that. Um, you can start getting quotes for insurance. You can start looking at for your marketing. You know, will, will you need leaflets or a Facebook or advertising? So you can get a good idea of those indirect costs and you can also research your direct costs. Um, so you should be able to get a list of these two together and estimate figures. So you should be able to get roundabout figures for these because they really help you make the decision whether or not you should move forward with the business. Once you have those uh, direct and indirect costs, you can then work out what your margins are. So, so what profit you could potentially make on your product or service. So this example is for a uh, t-shirt company. It's kind of really easy to look at in this way. Um, so at the top, you know, this is to produce 10 t-shirts because it's easier to work out the cost of, of lots of t-shirts rather than maybe just one, but yours would be different. So you've got the quote for the material, the zips, the cotton, the manufacturing, the care labels. So we've got an estimate of all the costs associated uh, with the production of that t-shirt. So these are all direct costs at this point. Um, so to make 10 t-shirts in this example, it costs £81. Um, to get your cost per t-shirt, we obviously do the £81 and we divide that by the 10. So we know to make one t-shirt is £8.10. When we look at the price, so the price for £40, we've got that from that market analysis. So when we back a few slides, when we looked at the Ferraris and the Porsches, um, for this example, we've mapped the t-shirt companies that are similar to us, and we've looked at, you know, we're a little bit cheaper than, um, we're a little bit cheaper than Burberry, but we're more expensive than Topshop. So we've plotted where we think we can enter the market. So we're gonna charge 40 pounds for our t-shirt, and then you've got the calculations there for your profit margin. So you're 40 minus your eight pound 10. So per t-shirt, we're gonna make 31 pound 90 profit. And then there's also a calculation there, how you work out your profit margin as a percentage, um, which is really important. So this is an example for a product. So what you can then do is once you've got an idea of your direct costs, you can plug those numbers in and work this out for yourself. Because ultimately we're all here to start a business that is gonna make us money and is gonna be profitable. The next slide here is how you would work out for a service-based business. So they're slightly different, you know, product-based um, just has its kind of direct costs. A service-based, your cost is your time. Um, so for anyone that's a kind of graphic designer, web designer, freelancer, creative, your asset is you, you're giving your time in your business. And in order to work out the viability of that, you need to go through a few more steps. So what we've got here um, as the example, and you, you need to follow this step by step. So how many weeks will you work across the year? So are you starting this as a part-time business, a full-time business? Um, bearing in mind when you start, when you're self-employed, no one's gonna pay you for sick days or holidays, so it's not realistic that you're gonna work every week in the year. So this 46 weeks allows, you know, a couple of weeks off for Christmas, a little bit of sickness, and it just builds in some of that lag time where you're not necessarily gonna be uh, making money. How many days a week will you work? So yeah, a lot of people initially when they start will be doing this part time, um, but maybe you are starting this straight away as a full time business. So in this instance, five days a week, and then they're gonna be working six hours a day. Um, or, you know, make sure you base this around your industry as well. So, you know, there's no point opening a food business for one hour a day. Um, so make sure you base it around the industry and the typical hours that you need to work in that industry. So you multiply all of those together and 
this will leave you with 1,380 hours. So what this tells you is in a year, you're going to dedicate 1,380 hours to the business. You then need to look at your indirect costs. So your indirect costs are all those things that we spoke about, the marketing, the rent, the insurance, um, any memberships, all the kind of running costs of the business. You then also need to look at your salary. How much money do you need to take from the business per year in order to survive? So both of those added together, your personal salary plus all of the cost of the business um, are your total indirect costs. So in this instance, it's £27,000 a year. And you then divide that by the number of hours you're going to work. So 27,000 divided by 1,380. And what this leaves you with is an, a minimum hourly rate. So the £19.56, what this tells you as a service-based business is that unless you are charging more than £19.56, you're not making any profit. That's your minimum hourly rate. Um, and what this gives you is a ballpoint figure to work off of. So it gives you a cost um, because it can be really hard to, to price your time. You then do exactly the same calculations as what we did for a product based business. So this example is an IT consultancy. Um, they've got some direct costs in there. So they have got some travel and they've also got their hourly rate in there. So the total of their travel plus their time, so that £19.56 that we've just worked out, um, in total it cost them £47.12 to deliver that consultancy, and that's paying themselves and covering all their costs. Um, they know from their market analysis, they've plotted all the other IT consultancies, and they know they can charge £60 for the delivery of the service. So they're making £12.88 profit in this example, which is a 20% margin, 21%. Um, what these tell you is, you know, is that enough? Is that enough profit? Because you're not going to be selling one of them every day, every hour. Um, it helps you work out targets for the business. Um, it gives you a measure of the profitability. Um, and it's all dependent on what you want here. Like, if you're looking to set yourself up as self-employed because you want to pay yourself a salary and you want to develop a portfolio, um, potentially a smaller profit margin would be fine because you're paying your salary. But if you're looking to launch a business that you want to grow and take on staff and develop um, and grow into a large business, potentially this this profit margin of 21 percent might not be what you were expecting might not be what you wanted so potentially we need to go back to the drawing board in that example um, but if anyone's got to this point if anyone does these calculations and wants some support or advice again it's a really open opportunity to get in touch with us and we're really happy to support you individually because i'm really aware that we're going through this quite quickly it's quite general um but it's really to take you through the steps and the considerations that you need to make when you're thinking of starting your business so we've gone through entrepreneurial iq articulating your idea and then viability so the next element of that framework is feasibility so what's the plan? How can you actually execute this? Is it possible to deliver this? Um, I always use this example because um, at the weekends, I always have really good intentions. Um, I always start out thinking I'm going to be super healthy and pack my lunch and really plan out the week. Um, and when I do that, my week goes pretty well. Um, when I don't do that, I'm running to Costa, grabbing something on the way, going home, eating a bag of crisps. Um, so it's the same with your business. If you start without a plan and out without working out the steps and the feasibility, the likelihood is it's going to be pretty chaotic. But if you start with a plan um, and you start with a plan and goals and milestones, um, the likelihood is it's going to go pretty well. So the feasibility is a really important step. 
um, there are so many different audiences that your plan might be useful for. So you might be developing a plan to show to an investor, to show to your lecturer, to show to a bank to raise funding, to maybe come and show to our team to look at getting more support. Um, you might be bringing on a business partner. Um, you absolutely need a plan to engage all of these people. But at this stage in your development, um, probably the most important person for the plan is yourself. So the type of plan that you develop really needs to work for you. Um, and we do a whole workshop on business planning. Um, and we'll talk to you about the workshops at the end, but we do a whole workshop on business planning, which is all focused on this area. These are all the different types of plan. So when you're going through your planning phases and your feasibility, there's so many different ways you can approach this. You can do a really long business plan, you can do an investment plan, you can do a growth plan, you can put together a 12 month projection. There's so many different types of plans and we're gonna show you one plan that we think is quite good for this first step. Um, and the reason we plan is, is to look forward, to set goals and milestones, but also to manage risk um, and to think ahead about what the potential risks might be. And it's always good time to think about the pestle, so the political, economical, social, technological, legal, environmental things that might affect your business. The three P's, personnel, people and partnerships um, and the resources you might need. So when you're planning, it's really important to consider all of these different elements and how they might be relevant to your business. Um, so, yeah, is your business using an old technology? Could technology replace your business potentially if you're thinking about a long term plan? Um, if you're starting an ice cream business, you know, are there certain months where you're not going to make any sales? Um, will the heat wave or um, rain really affect your business. Um, last year, there was a worldwide shortage of Prosecco, which really affects some people's business. The Brexit word, potentially, how could that affect your business? So when we're planning, we're looking at the next six to 12 months, five years, and looking at whether any of these things will affect us. Feasibility is also the difference between working in your business and working on the business. So when people start, we often see people really focused on this list on the left. So seeing clients, writing programs, paying invoices, doing a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff. But particularly if you're looking to start and grow a business, you need to be on that right-hand side. You need to be planning, setting goals, measuring success, out there networking, working with mentors, um, developing your own education as a leader, you know, so feasibility in terms of having a plan, if you don't have a plan, you'll spend all your time working on the left and your business will kind of float along. Um, and if you really want to grow a business, you need to plan in time to do that stuff on the right hand side, because it's really, really important. Obviously, Reality is very different. You, you're going to start off at this stage having a plan. Um, and actually, in reality, things could be very different. Um, so at this stage in developing your business, and you're all going to be at different stages, don't spend, too, don't spend too much time on developing a plan because things will change very, very quickly. Um, things will develop and grow hugely. So this is the, this is the plan that we recommend for this stage in business and working out your feasibility and this is something called the business model canvas so uh this came back in 2008 so it's only been around about 10 years um, and it really revolutionized the way that we think about business planning before that it was very archaic long lengthy uh, 100 page documents um i've probably read a thousand business plans of the traditional archaic type um, and unfortunately I've never read one word for word no one ever reads them back to back they're looking for certain things 
So when you're in your planning phase, this is a one page business plan. One page, that's all you need. So you've got your um, nine sections here and these are all the different elements. They really help you figure out, do I actually have a business here? Is this a business? So starting from the left, key partners. Simply list, who are your key partners? Who are the people that you need to bring on board? Is UEL a key partner? Is your local council? Is there a certain manufacturer? Is there a key customer that you're going to need to get on board and partner with for your development? Next box, key activities. What does the business actually do? What is the product or service offering? What, what are you actually doing? What are the key activities of the business? Drop down, what are the key resources? What do you need to make this happen? Do you need an office? Do you need access to a library? Do you need a thousand tennis balls? I don't know, your business. Um, but what do you really need to get started that starts to build that resource list? Middle box, value proposition. What is your USP? So this is back to that idea slide. What makes you different? What value are you adding to the industry and your customer? Um, it's all very well being a coach and offering psychology coaching service. We get loads of psychology students starting coaching businesses. But what's different about you? Do you work with women? Do you work with older people? Do you work with people with eating problems, with mental health issues, um, going through divorce? Like, what, what's your specialism? Why would I come to you rather than someone else? Um, Next box over, customer relationships. So it's like your marketing strategy. How do you attract and keep customers? What are your marketing methods? So do you use social media, flyers? How are you gonna get your word out there? One down is channels. So are you gonna be a website? Are you gonna be e-commerce? Are you gonna be customer to customer? Are you gonna be business to business? What are the channels? What is your kind of selling platform? What's your platform for making sales and reaching customers? And then on the right, we've got customer segments. So who is your customer? You really need to be able to articulate who that is. Is it mums? Is it dads? Is it professionals? Is it young people? Is it kids? Um, and you need to know quite a lot about that customer. You need to really be able to list and identify about lots of different things about that customer. And then the bottom is really simple. What are your costs? What are the things you need to pay out for? And on the right hand side, how do you bring in money? What's the revenue streams? How do you make money from the business? Um, so this one page of business plan, we are going to drop this. Uh, we're going to send this to you as a resource. You can print it out. I would recommend you print it out as big as you can stick post-it notes all over it, um, write lots of notes, you might do lots of different versions, people often use this to help them decide between different businesses. Um, and yeah, if ever, if you continue with the business and maybe booking for a one-to-one -one with us or a phone call, the first meeting, we always get people to bring their business model canvas. This is the first task that we set people and it really helps us work with you on what that next step and goals are. And you can pick lots of different actions out of this. Finally, on feasibility is having goals. Like you really need to know why am I setting up a business? What do I want to get out of this? Do I want to pay for my salary? Do I want a Ferrari? Do I want to be doing this for the next 100 years? Um, it's really important to articulate why you're doing it and what your goals and milestones are, because you need to be able to measure success. Um, when you're an entrepreneur, no one pats you on the back and says, well done. You have to do that yourself. Um, and you can't do that unless you know what you're trying to achieve. So we've gone through entrepreneurial IQ. We've gone through the idea. We've gone through the viability we've gone through the feasibility so the final step is desirability i'm going to hand you over to Kadiza to talk through that step
I'm back. So we're going to talk about market research now. And I think it's something that often gets overlooked because it's not glamorous. People want to dive straight into what it is that their business or search is doing. Everyone thinks that they know it, but it's really important to test your assumptions. So carrying out market research is really important to help you have some direction and strategy. So I would ask you this question, but just to save us some time, here are the key reasons why people tend to carry out market research. So it could be a competitor's analysis, gathering customer feedback, so you could be an existing business looking to know how they can improve the product or service, and you will have experienced this when you go to an online store or a real life store, they will always ask, how was your service today? Is there anything you didn't find? And you get these pop-ups when you are on shopping websites too. So they're always gathering feedback on how to improve and what's missing to help them branch out into other products and services. Identifying market trends is really important, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. A big thing is aiding pricing strategies, which Becky talked about. So what is the benchmark? Where do you see yourself entering? Is it an achievable price as well? Are people buying at that price? And how do you also achieve the same price by matching quality? Do you have celebrity endorsement? Whatever it is to make it more desirable and ask for the price that you want to set your product at. Um, meeting consumer needs is very important. So you don't want to be creating something that nobody wants. You're just going to lose a lot of money and a lot of time. So you can't keep forcing things on people if they said they don't want um, beef burger flavor ice cream, for example. Who knows? It might be great. But you do need to test that assumption. OK. And also ideas for new product development. What is not being met right now in the market? Where are the gaps and what can you fulfill that isn't being met right now? OK. So also the customer is really important. You need to know what drives their buying habits. What are their fears and frustrations? What are the problems that they are dealing with? If you can solve a problem, you know, people tend to be happy to pay for it, go above and beyond, especially if it's a real pain. And also what are their aspirations? So if you're thinking about luxury brands, people aspire to have a product or, um, you know, a certain logo that they can wear to show that they fit a certain demographic or they've earned a certain amount of money. So this is aspirational buying. This could be down to cars, like Becky already showed you this example. People buy certain cars to show off certain things about themselves or even handbags. Let's start small. So thinking about what it is that's driving your customer is really important in terms of marketing messages and your strategy on how to communicate the value of your product to the right people. So there are three different categories that we can group products into. So you have candies, vitamins and painkillers. Um, so if you think about is your product a candy based product, so it's not a frequent purchase, sometimes it's seen as a treat, maybe in the long term people think it's bad for them, so they try to limit how much of this that they buy. A vitamin is something that is nice to have, but it's not essential, and a painkiller is a must have, it's solving a real problem there and then. So people might not shop around, if they know these painkillers work, they're not going to go on to you know, the pharmacy and go, which one's cheaper, which one is more effective, they're just going to know it works and they tend to stick to a certain brand and it's easier to build brand loyalty as well if you have a painkiller based product. So thinking about where the customer sits, the customer might buy candy if they're feeling like it, but it's not a sure thing. Um, vitamins are something that you might say that they should buy, it's good for them, but they can live without it. And the painkiller the customer will tend to buy quite often um, and addictive painkillers are what they consider as the best kind of cash cow product okay <laughs> so also think about the frequency in which they will buy something so again going back to is it a luxury or is it a treat is it an improvement or a swap so a vitamin might just be an upgrade or something that you're already buying and then the painkiller is a necessity type product or a staple so think about toilet tissue this is something that people continue to buy. So everyday products can be painkillers, but again, in the painkiller category, you have the luxury version versus the basics, okay? So think about where you sit in that. And does your painkiller, if you are in the painkiller category, does it solve it forever? So that means they're not gonna repurchase anytime soon. So if people are buying, say, bunk beds, um, at the point where they buy it, space might be an issue, but their children will outgrow this. So five year, 10 year lifespan, and then they might buy something else. So it's important to be very honest with yourself and see which category you fall into because it will change how many customers you need every day, every year to break even, and you know the number side of things, which Becky's already mentioned. Uh, vitamins might be a harder sell, but vitamins can also become painkillers if you can communicate their value enough. So you need to get people to see that the vitamin works for them to consider it as a necessity that they will continue to buy. 
Okay, so what else do you need to know when you're doing your research? Who is going to buy your products or service? But also you need to know is why won't they buy it? It's a really important question that I think people forget. Everyone wants to know who's going to buy, but they also need to see who they're missing off and how they can convert them to buy their product. How many people like this are there? And that's your market potential and size. Um, again, price to charge is very important. So that's a bit of analysis work we'll look at later. And then who is your real competition? And the reason that we kind of really emphasize that is that say you are starting a fashion brand, you say you want to be like Topshop or Zara, it's very unrealistic to set that as your original competition because these are global brands with stores all over the world and um, huge online store etc and obviously they've been around for a long time you are not entering the market at zara it's going to take you a long time to become a zara equivalent so the people you need to really research are those who are the same age as you in terms of business maybe have the same number of follow followers as you on social media um you know the same size the same kind of area that they're operating in they're your real competition it's good to set a benchmark and aspire to be a certain business, but you need to find out who is doing what you're doing right now and is in the same area as you in terms of resource and capital, because otherwise you're always going to be failing and trying to play catch up and set your limits almost too high that they're unreachable. And that can be very negative for you in terms of moving forward and feeling like you don't have a good business. It's only because you're trying to reach too far too soon. So back to the customer, really discovering and validating them is a huge thing that people miss out. They create their product or service and they think they know who it's for and it tends to be someone just like them. And that's a problem because some people like them might buy it, but they might not be the whole market. So think about the wider potential. So if you look at the top left in the search section, so there's customer discovery and customer validation. And in the bottom of that, it says pivot. So pivot means you just keep going around in this cycle until you've validated that the customer is who you think they are. So you might have parents as your customer market because you've developed something for the children's market, let's say. Um, but until parents have started buying it and saying it's good and they continue to purchase it, you can't start building your customer base on parents. Say it might not be parents, it might be schools, it might be grandparents, it might be friends. So they might not be the person who has the most interaction with the child that you are offering it to especially if the product is considered candy or a vitamin, so it's a gift-based product. Until the right people are buying or until you see a cons consistent trend of who's buying, you can't say that that's your customer demographic. And only once that's been validated can you then start saying, okay, it's not parents, it's schools. And then you start targeting schools and you build your customer base on other schools and other uh, people in the education sector and you build your company based on that customer profile. OK, so you can always say, you know who it is. You might have a rough idea. So it's good to have a couple of groups, but you need to test and validate that. And the people who are buying are actually your customer, not who you want them to be. Getting inside the customer's head also helps you create that profile and it also helps you be in the right place. You need to know how old are they? What do they like to buy? What is their lifestyle? What are their political views? Where do they stand on things? Because if they believe in the brand and that you're building and your ethos, then it's easier to sell to them. Um, certain customers with certain lifestyles, again, will probably read certain magazines or certain social media profiles and that's where you build those channels of bloggers and influencers because you know your customer is also following said people okay so it's really important to really understand who your customer is because if you miss that entirely you're going to have all your uh, attention and energy focus in the wrong area so Back to Market Research 101, so we have primary and secondary research, which I'm sure we've all done before, you know, primary research being field research, stuff that you've conducted yourself firsthand, be it questionnaire surveys, observations and trials. And then secondary research is desk research and looking at the market in a wider sense, things that have been published online, things that are larger um, bits of research, shall we say, so like the census on people, um, or going on Statista, and I'll list a few others later on. 
So an easy thing that you can begin with, which is entirely free, is going to do a competitive analysis. You can do this online or in person simply by walking into the store. You can see what prices that they are charging. You can see what their customer service is like. You can see their product range quite easily as well. And then again, you can do this on the website. You can see how they've listed their best sellers. You can do a high to low filter as well. So it's good to see what is it that they are charging and what they're trying to compete on and where you sit on that. You can also read their customer reviews, which is really important to see, are they creating value to people? So that's really good for you to do. And this is all free, you could do it at home, but it's nice to see um, both aspects of online and in person if you can. So to recap on that, you can speak to your competitors directly. Sometimes people work for their competitors to get a real good insider understanding of that industry or that um, product or service category. You can purchase as a client, so mystery shopping. If they are entirely online based, how quickly does the package arrive to you? Is it broken? How is it packaged? Is there any discount codes that they add inside? All those kind of things. So the whole experience from clicking to get it into your cart to getting it to the door. A review of the website, again, like I said, Sourcing their financial accounts is slightly a step forward, but like I say, you have to find out who your real competitors are. So even if they're a year or two years ahead of you, it's good to see are they profitable in those two years. Um, and that's all easy to find on Companies House. And again, um, media coverage is really important. What are the reviews that they're getting? Are they getting any good press? Are they getting any bad press? Have they won any awards? Um, what are people saying about them on social media? These are all things that you can do from home, from your phone even, and just sit down and kind of gather all that information. And those gaps or the things that they're not really excelling on is where you can really step up and fill those gaps. I won't go too much into the SWOT analysis because we touched on this on the entrepreneurial IQ slide, but this is really important to do on your business, okay? What are the strong points of your business? What will you do well or better than your competitors? Um, what resources do you have that they don't have, for example? Um, maybe you are your customer, so you have a better understanding of that. If your customer are students, again, you have access to the student body if you are still studying. You know, what are your weaknesses? What could you improve? What do you lack? Um, you know, and how you can hopefully turn that into strengths because you know that's where you're already not excelling in. So try not to focus too much on your weaknesses unless it is something that you need to go back and mitigate. Maybe it's just another person to have on the team. So it could be easily solved through staff. Um, weaknesses, people tend to always think is a funding issue, but it's not always that. You can get creative about figuring out how you can overcome these things. Opportunities are really important. So looking at are you filling an un the field area of the market. So it's an opportunity for you to be the first or the best or someone who's doing it differently, someone who's uh, creating a product or service for a new customer demographic. So people who've never experienced it before, which is great. And then threats again, knowing where your limitations are. Again, if it is a skills thing, if it is a funding issue, how are you going to keep yourself afloat? Okay, so for people who want to start social enterprises, they tend to struggle with their cash flow, and that could be a threat. Being um, completely dependent on grant based funding can be a threat if you don't know how to generate your own revenue. So, staying in business is suddenly the biggest weakness that you have because you can't say that you have enough funds to keep you afloat, keep you going for the next year, and give you that stability that you're looking for. So quickly going over secondary research, the things that are already existing, articles, books, newspapers, reports, things on the internet. A place you can go to is the library. Libraries are fantastic to help you do research. A lot of them have free services. So you go in, book with them, and they will assign someone to do research with you. So a one-to-one -one at, say, the British Library or the City Business Library. Both of them are in the city centers. And I highly recommend you go and look at them because they have people whose sole job is to help you do your research. They also have access to online reports, which you would normally have to pay for. So again, you can get the most up-to-date research on your sector, on your product or business that you're hoping to launch, and you'll have an expert there helping you do that. So I highly recommend you go in there and you talk to someone and book that in. Um, IP centers, so intellectual property is also something worth noting. And this is the kind of things that we can protect in our business or our service. So here's an overview of different types of intellectual property. You've probably heard of some of these terms before, copyright, patents, trademarks, designs, and other. And again, it's kind of grouped down to what can be covered by what, and some of them have overlap as well. 
So spend some time looking at that and see if you have something worth protecting. Usually you won't, so I wouldn't spend too much money on worrying about that. But if you do have something that is truly innovative, you might want to patent that. Um, and again, they vary in cost depending on how complex it is and how many countries you want to protect yourself in as well. But again, this is something slightly more specialized, so you can come to a one-to-one -to, -one to discuss that. Um, but yeah, sh you shouldn't have to worry too much about this at that moment, again, unless you have the new Facebook or something completely <laughs> that will change the whole market. Another thing you can look at is trends. So this helps you kind of verify the demand of something over time. So a tool that I would recommend is Google Trends. It's free to use. You just type in on Google, Google Trends, and you put in different keywords to see um, what are people searching for. So it give you up-to-date data. You could break it down by different countries. So you can look globally. You can look locally and you can also change the the time frame as well so is it a 12 month period is it a couple of years is it the last six months just to verify is there demand for what you're doing if you were say to start um a product for the children's market so here we've got buggy strollers prams and push chairs you can see prams is the most searched for term so if you were to launch a new type of pram pram is probably the best keyword you want to use if you were marketing it as a buggy or a push chair or even a stroller you might not get as many hits so even though they are all essentially the same product the terminology is really important to see how you would go about pushing that out there in terms of language okay so here we've got also, if you will say, trying to go app based, just putting the two words iPhone versus Android. So if you look at the top, we've got in blue iPhone and we've got Android and then you can add more terms as well. So you can add as many as you like and we'll just add another line on the graph. So if you were to launch an app, it would show you straight away. If more people have iPhones over Androids, you would want to start in the iOS app store. Um, and do that version first before you invest in creating the Android version of that. And then if you see it breaks it down by uh, regions as well, so who's searching for it, where in the world. And this is good if you want to penetrate globally or where you want to focus on. It shows you where the demand is higher. And again, it gives you a related search queries as well. So people who tend to search for iPhone will also search for iPhone XR or iPhone XS Max, for example. And those who are searching for Android, again, it shows you what else they're searching for. So related searches are really important to see what other things are happening in that market, where else can you expand to, and what other trends are emerging in that subcategory. Okay, Facebook is a great place as well to determine your customer market size. Um, this is another free thing that you can do, so you don't have to pay for this. All you need is a Facebook page. Again, you just create that page for free. You don't have to publish it. So it's private, no one knows it exists. And then once you've created that page, you go to set up an ad. And that'll be very easy for you to find because Facebook really wants you to spend money with them. So set up an ad be very obvious on your page to help you spread the word about your product or service. So straight away, it will tell you how you want to target your customer base. And it has all these little options, so from location, age, gender, what language they speak, uh, what relationship status they're in, and what their interests are. And if you see here on the right, based on what's been inputted here, so um, French-speaking people aged 18 to 30 who are single and interested in dating, at the bottom right here it says the potential reach is 34,000 people who kind of tick all those boxes. So if that is who you're targeting through maybe your French dating app by the looks of it, um, it tells you how many potential people may use your product. And I stress the word may, it doesn't mean all of them will, but it's a great place to start with. And as you filter it more and more, so you might not want to just do the UK, you might just want to do London, you might just want to do a certain postcode. So, for example, we're in Newham, we don't know how many French speaking people there are here, for example, but it helps us really hone down on that number and then test through pushing out ads to them or at least just to grasp how big the potential market is. If the market is too small, then it might not be worth you pursuing. OK, so this is something that I highly recommend you play with. Um, just to kind of get a good grasp of real life data as well, because things you find online tend to be out of date, especially if you're getting it for free. And it doesn't give you the control here that you can see on Facebook. Um, it might just give you a country as a lump, as a lump figure, but it won't give you specifics in terms of targeting it by a uh, borough or city or a number of cities if you're looking at a, a wider range of people. So, 
primary research, what can we do for free by ourselves? So questionnaires, observations, trials, focus groups, you've probably heard of all these different aspects. So we're going to look at the power of social media and how you can kind of test that. So social media, again, is free. It's really effective now in terms of market research and also being a direct way to reach your customers. So if you look at the population of different social media sites and platforms, as you can see, Facebook by far has the most number of active users. Again, it's partly because they were the first big social media platform. And also, if you are tending to do any research or if you want to have a page, Facebook is the best place to be because your customers most likely be on there. And then you can see the breakdown from WhatsApp, Messenger, Instagram and the like. Another thing to be aware of is once you know who your customer is and what age they fit into, you realize they use different platforms. Okay, so it's good to be on Facebook, but if you're going for a certain market, you need to be on the platform that they're at because that's the communication channel that they tend to be using. So you can see the older demographic tends to be on LinkedIn and Twitter and the younger markets are Facebook and Instagram and there's some consistency there as well. Um, and also Facebook and Instagram are one and the same now, Facebook own Instagram. So if you do have a Facebook, it's easier for you to be on both platforms simultaneously as social media management can be quite intense. Again, knowing your market is really important to say if you were going for the teen market here, it says Snapchat is the best place to be. So if you looked on the other graph, Snapchat was probably one of the lowest uh, populated. But if your market is teens, it's the, the number one place to be to reach your audience. Different platforms also do different things. So again, you need to make sure you're communicating in a way that your customers want you to get your message across. So being on the wrong platform is a waste of energy and time. And especially if you're using it as an advertising channel, it can be a waste of money. So knowing who your customer is will help you figure out where they like to hang out and how they like to communicate. So again, you know, Facebook has 1 billion plus customers um, and users actively. Um, so that's a great place to begin. Twitter is probably more about, you know, broadcasting and getting your message out there, but it's not so much a visual site as, say, Facebook. Pinterest is more of a social site in terms of helping you with creating image boards and lifestyle and cooking, which is really popular. So if that's a creative market and you're in the how-to sector, that's a great place to be. And then uh, lastly, LinkedIn is great for business to business. So if you are a service and you want to meet decision makers and people who hold budgets or it is a business based service, that's the place that you want to be communicating. So how do we go about understanding what the data is saying? So it's good to be on the platforms, but how do we measure that what we're doing is correct and it's working? So looking at the back end of these different sites, so these are known as the insights. So say we were on Instagram, for example, if you have a business page on Instagram, so do stress that you need to have a business page on Instagram. If you have a personal profile, it won't give you this information. And all of this is free. It comes with your with your profile. So it would tell you what your followers uh, makeup is, basically. Do you have more male or female? What age are they? Where are they based? How active are they and when are they active? So if you see here at the bottom, it says on Mondays, people are most active from 12 a.m. to, to 6 a.m. In, in, the, in the night hours. So um, that's when you should be posting to become visible. It also shows you what kind of content is popular. So it's good to have um, frequent posts on social media. It's really highly recommended, but you need to be posting posting the kind of stuff that they're interested in. So it shows you what posts have done really well and it will give you a snapshot of that. So it shows you what kind of images, maybe if it's a quote based product. Um, these are the kind of things that are really useful. So you want to be doing more of that. It will show you the reach. But the really important thing is if you look on the last image, how many clicks have you got off the Instagram page onto your website and then onto your shop. So this is the conversion that you want to be looking at. It's great to have likes and to have comments and to have a reach, but what you want to be doing at the end of the day is selling. You can also ask your customers lots of questions. So you've probably seen polls on Instagram. So these are really popular and easy to use. You can ask them about products. You can ask them about services. You can ask them about pricing. So do throw these questions out at your um, customer base. And you can do the same thing on Facebook. 
But remember, just because people are clicking on things, it doesn't mean that they will necessarily buy that. So uh, a certain Subway sandwich might sound good on paper, but taste wise, again, it might not translate as well as the real thing. So you don't want to spend all your money creating something based on a poll. I would say use the poll and then go out and do more field research, do a taste test and then go out and then do your mass production if you get to that. Things that you can also find out is, you know, what's the right price to charge? Where should I be? Would you like to buy online? Do I need to be in stores? Um, what kind of promotions work with your customers? Do they want free shipping? Do they want a discount code? And also the variety of products that you sell and provide. These are all great things that you can find out asking your customer directly. So likes and comments are great, but they, a lot of them are vanity matrix. It doesn't tell you anything. What people look at to help them drive their sales is customer reviews. So getting five stars or one star is great. Um, not to get one star, but I mean to get the information is fantastic. So it shows people have purchased, but if you can add a name and a testimonial, it makes it more real. So just like when people ask others for uh, recommendations, if I know Oliver and Rosie and Bethany have all said this product's great and they've given it five stars and they've added the extra information of why they think it's five stars, it's easier to sell based on just a statistic. So I would highly recommend you getting testimonials if you have got an online store. It really helps you rank higher on Google and your trust rating will go up as well. Pestle, Becky has already mentioned, so I won't go into that too much. But again, it's very important to know how this is going to affect your product. So if you are launching something and it's very plastic heavy, as we know right now, everyone's really aware of you know, the environmental impact. There's legislation coming in to stop businesses using plastic. Environmentalists are all over it. And socially and culturally, we are moving away from single use and looking at being more sustainable. So think about how that will affect your business and how you can change that before you start creating a plastic based business. Can you look at other suppliers before you go to market? Um, other ways to, to test is obviously giving people free products and getting their feedback. So when Innocence Movies started up, they kind of popped up in a local supermarket, um, sorry, shopping centre, and they put out their free top flavours and they got people to taste them. And if they liked it, they put it in the yes bin. If they didn't like it, they put it in the no bin. So again, as a very clear observation of what they prefer. And then whichever one got the most yeses, they launched with that one flavour to begin with and they expanded. So this is a great way for you to test before you put any more money into development. Another thing you can do is get other people to fund your idea and business. So this is known as crowdfunding, which you may have heard of before. Crowdfunding is a great way to test demand. If people are willing to buy or pre-buy something based on just the concept, based on a video you've created or a really passionate pitch you might have put ahead of them, then it gives you the capital to begin to develop your product or service, especially if it's very expensive to get going. So these are known as pre-sales and there's lots of ways to reward the people who put in that money and invest with you initially. So there's different types of platforms. You've got everything from donation-based platforms, which are charity-based, then reward-based, so Indiegogo and Kickstarter, which are more product-based products. Um, and then you've got loans and equity-based um, crowdfunding sites, which I wouldn't recommend to begin with, um, but those are the higher stake kind of options. Obviously, you have to either pay back with your loan with interest or you have to give away parts of your business. So I would recommend trying to go for a reward-based platform if you have a product that you can pre-sell to your customer base. Really, really do... Uh, bear in mind that you are in research mode, not sales mode. So don't take anything personally. I know what you're creating is something you're very passionate about and put a lot of love and care into, but your customer will tell you it's either too expensive or there's things that aren't working, things that will put them off from buying. And if you're not fixing those things, then you're gonna create something that they don't want and this ultimately won't sell. So you don't want to be burning a hole in your pocket. You want to listen to them and show them you're listening and they will appreciate that in the long term as well. So again, planning ahead, think about is your business seasonal? Is it a trend? When should you be testing? So again, if you're going to start an ice cream based company, the best time to taste those flavors is either the year before while it's still hot or try to test in the winter time. People do tend to still buy ice cream, believe it or not. But you need to know because when you go into production, you need to have it ready for the season it will sell. You can't be going into production when you should be selling. Okay. 
also be aware of trend-based products. So charcoal was a huge trend. I think it's still going strong, but there was a point where you saw charcoal in everything from ice cream to food to, you know, what it could put into your body, put it on your face, and people couldn't get enough of it. So think about those trends. Will they last? Are you creating something that is truly um, worth buying and will outlast the trend of that? So if it is the best charcoal-based toothpaste, it will continue to sell after the trends kind of died down. People will see it as a staple because they've seen the results. So they may buy it as a candy or a vitamin, but then it becomes a painkiller. It becomes their favorite toothpaste, for example. Always review and gather feedback. Again, this is so important. We see big companies do it. So as a small company or as a pre-launch, you should always be gathering that feedback as well to always know that you are putting your energy and your money into something that people want and ultimately then they should buy it. If it's everything that they've said they wanted, hopefully they'll be more likely to buy it when you put it out there. Again, keep using social media to engage your customers, products, um, naming through competitions putting out freebies or you know discounts are really popular uh, packaging design product design product size even is really important so knowing if it's too big maybe if you can make a smaller version will they prefer to buy it will they see it as more value for money etc then there's also reward programs that we've all probably been part of. A lot of the, us have loyalty cards now, we're collecting points and it builds that loyalty. So they tend to come back to you because they wanna use their points or earn more points, okay? If you let them feel that they are part of something that's exclusive, so they are the first to try a new product because they've bought from you before. Again, it's about building that community. So loyalty schemes are really popular. If you can build one into your business or service, I highly recommend it and it will help you build that uh, that customer base and also a fan base you need them to advocate for you okay so now we've gone through lots of things we're just going to quickly recap um, on all the things that we've said in terms of market research so do ensure your primary research is representative of your target market but first validate that your market is the one that's buying from you so stay pivoting until the right person is buying or you see a consistent trend in who's buying from you and then you build your customer base on that um, make sure you know which questions you want to answer before you start, because if you don't know that, then you can start waffling. Um, people don't have much time, especially if you're doing this face to face. So I would say have um, about three to five questions. Always ask your most important questions first as well, in case they leave halfway through the survey. Um, explain why you're um, doing the research as well, so they know why it is that they, you want to gather this information. Maybe there's an incentive you can add. Maybe they get free Amazon vouchers. I don't know. Um, and then there's lots of free tools to use like SurveyMonkey, Google Docs, and also all the social media stuff that we've already covered. Do a variety of different research methods as well to consistently get the results and see that there's a trend. So like I said, what might work on paper might not work in real life. Also, don't ask um, bias questions. So do you think this product looks good is already shifting them to say yes. They might feel that they can't say no, they can't criticize it, they can't give you any constructive feedback. So don't do, be defensive when they do that. You need to be as open as possible to get the most from your customers in terms of feedback. And that honesty is really gonna help you long term. Don't leave the most in question, important questions till last. Like I say, people get bored of answering lots of lots of questions. So always ask the most important question first if you can. So keep it short. By creating long intensive surveys, people are more likely to drop off and not finish. So that's not good if you've got incomplete data. And don't ignore your market research. If you're spending all this time and energy and money sometimes as well through ads to test what your product or service can do for the customer, don't ignore what the research says. So lots of points of homework. So all those different things that we've covered today is the entrepreneurial IQ. So do conduct the self-assessment that we will drop in later. Feasibility, complete your business model canvas. Try to complete all the boxes and see where your knowledge gaps are. These are points of research as well. And like Becky said, if you do come to see us for a one-to-one, -one, we would want to see your business model canvas to begin with. Um, the desirability, again, undertake market research. I know I kind of went through everything really quickly, but happy to go through this in detail one-to-one. -one. And then the viability, making sure that your costs is um, lower than your revenue. Is this business profitable? Will it pay your bills, basically? And can you afford to run this? So we also mentioned that we have workshops. 
So we run uh, eight workshops um, twice a year, which are like the fundamentals of business. We have gone through this really quickly. So thank you for your attention uh, during that time. So we run workshops on all of those topics in detail. We're in the middle of a series of workshops. So we have got one taking place next Wednesday on tax and national insurance. Um, not the most exciting topic, but really, really crucial um, when you're starting out to really know what you might need to pay and when. So that's taking place next week. We are based at the Knowledge Dock um, Business Centre, which is on the Docklands campus. Um, so please do join us for that if you are interested. And then finally from us is our, is our contact details. So as we said, we, um, we are a free service for students and alumni um, to help you get started. You know, we're not here to help you grow if you've already been developing a business, um, already been running a business for two or three years, um, that we're not best placed to support you. But if you are in those really early stages and looking to start, um, we really do have some really robust support available for you here. So our email addresses are there. Um, please do uh, drop us a line. We will also be sending out all of the slides and the templates for you to start working. There's also a link there to our newsletter where you can join up um, and you'll be kept up to date with our programs, um, our funding opportunities, opportunity to engage with businesses and events um, that we are running here at the enterprise team. Um, Cadiz and I, it's been really lovely to share this early stage um, business planning session with you. We really hope that it was useful. Um, we're going to stick around for kind of five, ten minutes. Um, if anyone has any questions, please do uh, send them in now under the questions or the chat function. Um, if you do have any questions, please ask them now. If not, um, we will of course send everything out to you and you can email us direct and have a direct conversation with us so thank you so much for your attention whatever you do off the back of today if you do you know we wish you all the luck in the world with your business it's a fantastic journey to go on um and we really hope that we can be part of that journey with you So just seeing if there's any questions. So we are going to drop the files into the webinar, so you shouldn't have to send us your email addresses. Uh, we'll be doing that right this second. Just quickly save we it. Can send them out. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so it doesn't look like there's any questions. So we're going to send this out. Yep. So we will end the webinar now um, and we look forward to hearing from you.